All right, good morning, my friends. It's Monday, brand new week. Who knows what's going to happen? Um, and so we'll see. We'll find out. And we're just going to plot along, right? We're going to uh, do our deal. Hope you had a great weekend. Um, we, uh, man, Friday, uh, I had all day almost to myself. Um, Tamsin and I went to get some coffee. Uh, Friday morning, did a little walk up in Springville, a new little coffee shop up there. Not new, it's been there a while. It's just kind of, we just enjoy it. Um, and so we um, we were up there, and then uh, she took off to do some things, or rather I did, and then she followed uh, her sisters off to play. And uh, and I uh, spent the morning studying and, and just meditating and having a great time all day Friday. Saturday, took off early, went to um, uh, Nashville to see her Nashville kids play play soccer and, and, uh, rode with, uh, so I got to be with two of my boys, um, Saturday and, uh, man, it was a great day. Yesterday church, uh, really, really, uh, incredible time. Our worship is, um, it's just one of my favorite things we do, uh, and, and the share time and just the response of worship to God, really, really strong and good. And we had, we had dinner together. We celebrated Lord's supper together. Uh, <clears throat> and then, uh, the Tamster and I, uh, after all of that, took a little walk uh, down through the city of Trustful and rode around and um, tried a new one of the new places, uh, get a smoothie, and uh, it's just a great weekend. Um, and so here we are. We're ready to rock and roll now, and we're in the Book of Acts, chapter seventeen. We're kind of working our way through this, and uh, and I'm excited about about where we are and what's going on. So uh, we're continuing really more of the same. Uh, and so I, I, instead of just, you know, uh, telling stories, you know, Hey, this is what happened here. And this is what happened in this town. I, I want us to begin to kind of just see and develop, uh, kind of a methodology that Paul has here for, for what he's doing. And so, uh, if you remember from last week, um, they had, uh, been beaten and arrested in Philippi after having spent, uh, some time there. By the river, there were no synagogues in Philippi. You have to have a certain number of men in order to uh, a Jewish men who, in order to establish a a synagogue. Obviously, Philippi didn't, but they had a good, strong group of women. Uh, <clears throat> they were down by the river, uh, God fearing women. Paul and Silas and his team came in, spoke the truth of the gospel that Jesus was the Messiah. Uh, Lydia believed. Uh, and they, they brought her into, uh, she, she brought them into their home and they, they kind of had an outpost there. And, uh, then because of some events of Paul, um, getting, getting rid of a demon and one of the girls, uh, it upset their apple cart, so to speak. And, uh, they were beaten, accused of disrupting the whole thing, going against Rome and <clears throat> thrown in prison. God miraculously opened up the prison doors, released the shackles, the, the jailer, came to Christ, he and his household, they were baptized. Uh, Paul was, <clears throat> they asked Paul to leave, and he said, not so fast, my friend. I was a Roman citizen, and I'm a Roman citizen, and you beat me without a trial. Scared them to death, the city, and they just begged Paul, could you just leave, would you just leave, please just go. Because they had violated the law, they were now in trouble. So good news about that <clears throat> is that uh, it held them at bay, uh, the, the, the authorities in Philippi, from really attacking the church there in Philippi as it began to grow and nourish, and we know that it did. Um, so they leave there, and now we're in chapter 17. So they're still a little bit you know, bruised and banged up from that. Uh, and they begin, they they travel. So they go to Amphipolis and then Apollonia, and they, they come to Thessalonica. Now, uh, so they're just making their way west, a little west, and then, then eventually they'll head south after they leave here. But uh, they're just following, really, the, the Aegean Sea. And so um, I was figuring up today, I think they were walking, or however they got there, it's about 30 miles between. If they walked, it was a 10-hour walk every day from uh, Amphipolis, to Apollyana, and then <clears throat> to Thessalonica. So that would have been, you know, some fairly stiff walking unless they, you know, did a lift or something or Uber and, you know, a, a, a horse or a carriage or whatever. But uh, we they came to Thessalonica. Now, Thessalonica is the most amazing city, and we know about them uh, because Paul wrote two letters that we have in our possession 
Um, and so we, we know about that church, but it was a very prominent church, um, our, our place, not a church at this point, but it will be. We see it established. Thessalonica was an incredible town to where three rivers came together uh, that fed into the Aegean Sea. And anywhere there's rivers, there's going to be towns. And normally those every town's built around some sort of body of water, river, or whatever, because that was the mode of transportation. The Ignatian Highway, which was kind of really the, the Roman main highway through Europe, uh, was there, and so it, it was a prominent, very prominent city. So Paul goes in, and let's just read the text. Now, he goes to two cities. So he goes there. Uh, he's going to get run out of town there, and he's going to make his way to Berea. And it's a little south. It's kind of, uh, it's really not even on the map these days. It's just down uh, southwest of, of Thessalonica. And uh, But we, we're going to find some interesting things there about the Bereans that uh, you you hear a lot. So let's just read the text. Can we do that? And then uh, and then we're just going to kind of draw some, some commentary and things like that. Here, here's the first thing we need to know. The brothers immediately, oh, I'm sorry, I'm in verse 10. Um, let's read it together. Now, when they had traveled through uh, Amphipolis and Apollyon, and they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews, and according to Paul's custom, he visited them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scripture. So he's got this three-session format, right? So in, in the Jewish culture, you would go in, you would teach, and then there would be a question and answer time, and then you would then you would teach the next week, uh, either following up on their questions or you would be presenting new material from the scriptures, and and there would be dialogue, and this would this was their normal thing. So when Paul found a synagogue, he loved that because it gave him a forum and a platform to be able to proclaim the gospel. And so, so here he is. Listen, these are gospel. Th these men are going to preach the gospel. They're not going to be refused. They're going to they're going to walk as far as they have to walk to reach new territory to do what they do. Um, and so this is, I mean, it's, it's amazing what they do. Then it says this, uh, explaining and giving evidence that Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead, um, that Jesus, and then, and then saying this Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. Um, and some of them were persuaded to join Paul and Silas along with a large number of God fearing Greeks. So you had some of the people in the Jewish synagogue and they believed, well, there were some God fearing Greeks who they would allow in to hear truth as well. Um, and, and so it says in many of them, a large number of them rather, uh, and then some significant leading ladies or women in the community, which is kind of an unusual thing from a Jewish perspective and really from the worldly perspective too of Greece, that you would have prominent women. That normally meant that their husbands were, were fairly prominent. Uh, it meant they were probably of some sort of government aspect of things like that. So, so Paul was hitting on all cylinders, and he was hitting all the various groups there. It says, but the Jews becoming jealous and taking some of the uh, uh, wicked men from the marketplace formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. And they attacked the house of Jason. That's, that's all we know about him is that's where they were staying. And were seeking to bring them out to the people. When they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here also. And Jason has welcomed them. And they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another King Jesus. They stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things. And when they had received a pledge from Jason uh, and the others, they released them. So what we first find is Paul goes in, goes to the synagogue, people are being converted, and, and that created a great issue. And so, uh, it, then, so it says then, but the Jews becoming jealous and taking some of the wicked men from the marketplace formed a mob. So now you've got the Jews who go out into the marketplace and find the, the hardcore, right? Uh, the thugs, the gang guys, whoever's in the city. And they go, hey man, come on, we need you to help start a riot. Well, they're all in for the riot, right? So here you've got kind of the world with, with these Jews, and they're just meshing in. One, bystanders of the gang, they just love a war. And then you've got the Jews who are trying to stir things up. So uh, there's this chaos. It seems like chaos always follows Paul in that sense, or, or not, not chaos on his part, just it always starts a riot. Now, uh, so, so they go to Jason's house, drag the guys out, but they're not there. So when Jason assures them, hey, listen, they're leaving. They're, they're on their way. They're gone. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, they release Jason and let him go back to his home. We come to verse 10. 
the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night <clears throat> to Berea. All right. So they let him go back to his house. Paul and Silas uh, come back to the house, whether Timothy's there, you know, and Luke. Um, and, and it says, so they send them away at night. Hey, y'all need to get out of here, man. It's going to get really ugly if you don't. And when they arrived, so they go to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now, these people were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. For they received the word with great eagerness, explaining the scriptures, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. So they go into this synagogue, and instead of it stirring things up, they're like, wow, really? And so they would go back, and they would open up the scriptures themselves and search to see if what Paul said was, was true. So, man, you've got some, these are noble-minded people. They're not just going to accept just some new teaching. I appreciate that aspect of things. But what they didn't know is that Paul knew his scripture, and it was exact. So with great eagerness, they've examined the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore, having looked at the scriptures and, and agreeing with Paul, um, it says, therefore, many of them believed, along with the significant number and of prominent Greek women and men. Do you notice how women keep rising up here? Because the gospel will do that, right? While, while there is... Um, um, while there is distinction in the role, complementarianism we call it, while there is distinction between the roles of men and women, and that women aren't allowed to preach and to teach in God's kingdom, uh, they, they are very effective in, in ministry to women, very effective in serving, very effective in giving. And so you see that, that, that listen, the rest of the world will suppress women. You've seen it everywhere. It is the gospel that elevates women uh, to to the great standard of equality that they that they belong, and then it says, but when uh, the Jews of Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul and Berea, those those dirtbags, uh, they come hang out, and and they came there as well, agitating, stirring up the crowds. Then immediately the brothers sent Paul out to go as far as the sea, and Silas and Timothy remained there. Now, those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and receiving a command from Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they left. All right, now, let's just talk about this quickly, and then I want to bring in some, some kind of thoughts about this. So we see this pattern, right? Paul goes, and it's Paul, apparently, because Timothy and, and, uh, and Silas, they were able to kind of hang around. But, but Paul, he's like the lightning rod. He's the bull in the china shop. Uh, he's the one who's going to go in and is so intelligently minded. Listen, he's a Pharisee of Pharisees. He's from the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, he, he kept the law in perfection. He understands the ins and outs of the scriptures uh, more than anyone else that he's going to run into. He's, he's that A-type personality, alpha male. He knows what's up. And so when he walks in, he, there's a confidence about him. And when he opens up his mouth and he speaks truth, he can back it up with a thousand scriptures, right? And this is, this is who he is. And he doesn't shy away from anybody. And he's unafraid of, of death. He, listen, he's, uh, he, he already was stoned and left for dead, right? Got back up, walked into the city, got his belongings, and then left. So this is, this is a man with great courage. And you're, we're going to see that he has some specific qualities that I think you and me should strive to, to have. So after Thessalonica uh, and stirring up the crowd there, he goes to Berea, walks in, and he finds a much more receptive audience. They're not like a little agitated and asking him questions, uh, you know, in taunting ways. They're like, well, let me go see what he says in the scriptures. And, and they go, he, hey, that matches. What he says matches. We see it now. And, and so then you get more gang people stirring things up. Stir, listen, everywhere the gospel goes, Satan will stir up to create havoc. He will either do two things. He will either uh, come as an angel of light, and he will take that truth, and he will mix it with a little bit of error so that it is, uh, it is diluted and it has no power in it, uh, or he will be as a roaring lion and seek to shut you up by, by overcoming, uh, you know, hoping that you will be overcome by fear uh, and, and, and fear of this life and, and he'll shut you down. He's always going to come in one of those two ways. So every time you and me will speak truth to someone, expect one of two things are going to happen. Either someone's going to come along and take that clear truth and dilute it by watering it down and making it say things it doesn't say. That's the whole deconstruction progressive movement right now. Oh, listen, hey, the scriptures aren't authoritative. Really, there's no hell. Um, 
you know, really Jesus is all we follow. Paul, I mean, you don't need to worry about him. We just, we just love people. We love everybody. That that's a watering down. So you come in and preach the gospel, you expect that to slide in and destroy everything you're doing that or go in and preach the gospel and expect that your name's going to be taken and driven through the mud. This, this is some things that you and me should expect if we're living the godly life and if we're doing that which god calls us we can expect to have those two assaults consider the military tactics but that's going to come they're going to infiltrate and distort just like a spy right so when you have a war you have the spies that go in and they they seek to learn what's going on they undermine it and then you have the the the, the military who just comes in and storms over you this is what we can expect satan to do every time we begin to speak the gospel, the good news of Christ. Every time we open up the truth and, and we share it, we live it, we should expect that. And so I think it's important that we see these things through the scriptures. And so that's what happened then in Berea. After they had reasoned through the scriptures and go, hey, man, we do believe in him, uh, then, then this is this is what takes place. And so uh, they run him out of town and they, they tell Paul, hey, man, just <laughs> this, is, this is what's to me comical about Silas and Timothy. They're like, dude, we're a little worn out. Uh, how about you just just go just go to the sea, man? Just just go as far away from here as you can, and uh, and so they send him, and he heads to Athens. Now he's going to get into some trouble there too, but but that's a it's a great deal. We're going to save that for tomorrow. So so he goes to Athens, and then he he commands receiving a command from Saul and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible. They left. He said, "All right, make sure you tell them." Uh, to to get get to me as soon as they can. Now let's just kind of have a conversation uh, about about what happens here. Uh, these are world changers, right? These are men who are upsetting the whole world. That's not just why is it that it seems like there's only like a handful out of each generation that that really does that, right? That that we're aware of. You know what I'm saying? That should be something that should be a part of our life on a daily basis. Uh, if if we are Living in this world for Christ, you, there's going to be hostility. And there's going to be people try to explain away why you live the way you live. And, and so, we one, we have to do two things. Evaluate our own life and then be aware of what's going on uh, with those around us. So, so what exactly were they doing, right? This is what we're talking about. What were they doing? Well, one, they were bold. They, they were bold. They, they didn't just go in and chit-chat and take years to establish some sort of relationship. They just went in and found a common uh, denominator, which for, for Paul was a Jewish uh, synagogue where they were people of like-mindedness. But he went to them. He wasn't, you know, like hanging out, waiting for people to say, hey, so what is it about you that's different? That's kind of our methodology that it seems to be these days in America. But this isn't what they did. They went to the marketplace, right? They went there and they said, hey, here's, listen, we know what you believe about this. Let me explain some things to you, right? This is what they were doing. And what was he doing? Well, he explained to them that the Messiah, they were expecting Messiah to come. I'm sure he went to Isaiah 53, uh, Psalm 22, Psalm 16, all of those, all three of those passages speak of the fact that the Messiah is going to come, but not as a ruling king. He's going to come as a suffering servant. He's going to die and he's going to be res resurrected. Uh, Psalm 16 makes that plain. And then he's going to say, and Jesus that was crucified in Jerusalem is that Messiah. And based on that, I'm sure because of everything else we've heard that they invited him to repent, right? Hey, so you need to change your mindset. Quit looking for, for a Messiah. Quit looking for the next big savior thing that's coming down the road. He's already come and he's alive today and his name is Jesus. You should repent of your thoughts about who he is. You should repent of your sins and turn from your pagan way of living and follow uh, the living God. So there was a repentance that was to take place. There was a belief that that what they said was true in the scriptures, that their sins had made a separation between them and God, and that there was no there was no bridge but the Messiah who is Jesus to bridge that gap and to, to atone for our sins. And then we should follow him. That is that we should take up our cross, deny ourselves, and follow him. That we should allow the transformation of him to change our life. That's the gospel, and that's what they preached. And they weren't ashamed of it. We tend to want to water it down these days. When someone challenges us on something, we don't know what to do. We just act like we've just you know, been struck by lightning or something. And he's saying, listen, be bold out there. Second thing is, know the truth, right? He was solid in his truth. 
I think this is the problem where we find ourselves in a lot of times is we don't know how to speak truth to error because we're not ultimately convinced about what truth is because the majority of American churches, and I'm not ranting here, I'm just saying the majority of American churches are teaching you to have your best life, so to speak. Uh, and they make the, the gospel about you. And so it's all, and it's, there's nothing not true about what they're saying. It's just that they're not speaking in the power of the gospel of Christ and about, about what it is. And so it's more man-centered than it is God-centered. Uh, and, so, and so Paul knew his scriptures and knew what the need of people were and, and presented it clearly. Sin, separation, salvation, those are the issues, right? Uh, he, his, his job was to comfort the disturbed and disturb the comforted. You've, you've heard that before, right? Uh, and so, you know, mo most people, uh, they, they think they're good. You know, I, well, I believe in Jesus. Yet there's no transformation, and transformation is always the way we see it. There's fruit. If there's no fruit, then there's no root of Christ in you. And so the gospel is about a new heart, a new spirit, and a new way of life. And so this is, this is where I wanted to share with us today just what was going on and what Paul was doing. All right, man, I can't wait to share with you some more of this in the morning. Our time goes quickly here. It'd be refreshed. But Lord bless you guys. And uh, man, Lord willing, I'm going to see you in the morning.